Juanita. I'm gonna have to have my glasses because I'm gonna have to read. Okay. <laughs> we'll pass them back and forth. Uh-huh. <laughs> I have them at home. I Juanita, I got another pair because I left one here. You know, remember that. Are you mic's on? Okay. Cool. We ready? Good evening and welcome to the October 27, 2022 Board of Education meeting. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices to avoid any technical interference with the microphones and taping of the meeting. A call in line for the community to hear the meeting interpreted live in Spanish has been established. The number to call is 508-924-5155. Again, the number is 508-924-5155. Uh, board member Lasalle Frazier, please make the announcement in Span Espanol, please. Buenas noches. Se ha establecido una línea telefónica para que la comunidad pueda llamar y tenga acceso a interpretación en español en vivo. El número a llamar es el 508-924-5155. Nuevamente es el 508-924-5155. Gracias and thank you. Finally, for those who are not able to observe now, this meeting is being recorded and can be accessed for later viewing on the Prince George's County Public Schools YouTube channel. Now for our board prayer and pledge of allegiance, which will be led this evening by Dr. Sabora Miller. Board prayer. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance, steer us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Guerrero, would you please call the roll? Yes, Madam Chair. Mrs. Adam Stafford? Here. Ms. Boozer Strother? Here. Mr. Saron Ruiz? Here. Dr. Harris? Here. Mrs. Lasaya Frazier? Present. Mrs. Biggins Murray? Present. Dr. Z. Miller? Present. Mr. Murray. Mr. Thomas. Here. Mr. Valentine. Here. Mrs. Williams. Present. And Dr. Miller. Present. Thank you. Now we will move to the adoption of the agenda for October 27, 2022 board meeting. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. It has been moved and second to adopt the agenda for October 27, 2022. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The agenda is adopted. Now we will move to 2.6, approval of the meeting minutes for August 18th, 2022 board meeting, September 6th, 2022 CIP hit public hearing meeting and September 8th, 2022 board work session. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. It has been moved and second to approve the minutes for August 18th, 2022, September 6th, 2022 CIP public hearing meeting 
and September 8th, 2022 board work session. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it, the minutes are adopted. Now we will go to the news break. Bienvenido El Salvador. Let's turn our attention to the projectors to view tonight's news break presentation titled Bienvenido El Salvador. Bienvenidos El Salvador and Kettering Middle School. We are here at Kettering because today the ambassador of El Salvador is here at the Spanish Immersion School, a place where she will feel right at home. It's not every school where a Spanish-speaking guest would be an instant superstar. But when El Salvador's ambassador to the United States, Millian Mayorga, took the stage at Kettering's multi-purpose room to help celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, every one of the students, Spanish speakers all, made Her Excellency feel like one of the family. Speaking both in Spanish and English, the ambassador touted her country's beauty and culture. But she also reminded her audience to be grateful for America's blessings, especially its schools. For you, it's very easy because you are growing up with this technology. In El Salvador, they are not as blessed as you guys. So you never know what's going on, you know. Uh, you only know United States, and sometimes you don't know that there is a country really close to you, like Mexico, Guatemala, or El Salvador, that they are really unprivileged. So you have to be very thankful what you have here. Gratitude was all around. As Kettering's diverse student body that does include 62 Salvadorian students showed their appreciation to the ambassador with welcoming signs, magnificent student-designed artwork, and one young lady in a native costume. Wow, what did you think of the ambassador today? Well, I think it was a great idea of the school. Like, I, well, I met her before, but this is amazing that she actually came to our school, you know? I feel like really happy of being Salvadorian and she's like representing the country. Ambassador Mayorga, a former legislator in her home country, reciprocated with gifts of her own, including a set of library books and her nation's flag, displaying the slogan, God, Union and Liberty. What a great program. You know, it took a lot to put this together. Uh, is it all you hope for? It's everything we hope for. We want Kettering Middle School Spanish Immersion to be on the map. We want our students to feel proud of who they are. And the students who aren't El Salvadorian, we want them to know that they can be ex exposed to other cultures, and we just want to include everyone. And I asked her if she was ever a teacher, but she said, no, I would give her a contract today. Exactly. <laughs> we need that. <laughs> we would love it. Um, as a matter of fact, half of our staff speak Spanish. They teach all of their lessons in Spanish, so it's a blessing to just be here at Kettering Middle School. I am from Puerto Rico. We also have staff from Dominican Republic and Spain as well, and they are doing the same thing. So we are more than open to learn English, and then my other students are more than open to learn Spanish. I know you can answer this question. Why is learning Spanish so important? Why immerse students in Spanish? It's very important because being bilingual, is a great advantage for because in the future they can be a great opportunity to get an amazing employment. So this is the reason that also the students can tell you, I'm here to learn Spanish because I want to be more amazing in the future. As for herself, the ambassador hoped that her visit both inspired the students and touched their hearts. For me, it's very special that to see these young people uh, studying about my country and I'm sure one day they're going to grow up and they're going to remember that an ambassador from El Salvador came to their middle school. At Kettering Middle School, there will be no forgetting such a generous visit by such a gracious lady. This is Dave Zarin reporting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Now we will move to item 2.8, the unsung hero. Colleagues and public attendees, it is my great pleasure to recognize Dr. Chidi Duru, teacher and science department chair at Crossland High School as our unsung hero for his great accomplishment in earning the prestigious Fulbright Teachers for Global Classrooms Program Award. The Fulbright Program is the U United States government's flagship international educational exchange program and is supported domestically and internationally. As a Fulbright recipient, Dr. Duru will be able to share knowledge and engage in cutting edge research in the United States and abroad. On behalf of the Prince George's County Board of Education, we would like to congratulate Dr. Chidi Duru for his amazing accomplishment and thank you for making us Prince George's proud. Is Dr. Duru here? Come on down. Prince George is proud again. Next, the report of the chair. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, inform everyone that Dr. Golson is representing Prince George's County Public Schools on the Harvard Graduate School convening panel presentation on education and climate action. How the education sector can drive impact with innovation, urgency, and leadership. And I'd also like to point out and acknowledge our board member, Pam, board member Pam, Pamela B Boozer Struther on the hard work with the uh, work study committee, which led to this, this conference. So let's give our board member a hand. We are just doing great things in Prince George's County. And the committee that worked with her, that uh, works, uh, works, work, group okay thank you uh, Pam now I'd like to offer a special point of privilege to our colleague um, board member Adam Stafford as a special point of privilege to present a recognition to Legends Charter School thank you I have the distinct honor this evening of presenting a very special award to the Legends Charter School community. Um, they have received the honor of being named as the Charter School of the Year. Yes, so I'm going to be uh, sharing a bit more about <clears throat> their honor. So Legends began their journey in 2017 with a commitment to serve the wonderful community of Prince George's County. Their approval in 2019 gave them the runway uh, going up against COVID in 2020. Uh, as difficult as that may be, they as first time operators during COVID made lemonade out of those lemons. Legends brought, <clears throat> bought a 80 foot thousand square state of the art facility in Prince George's County, along with 130 new jobs and a newly recognized AmeriCorps program to serve our students. Legends commitment to excellence and service remained steadfast and they persevered. 
with 90% of their students saying that they love their school and would recommend it to a friend. Legends Charter School made growth in both ELA and math with their diverse and caring founding principal, Courtney Aldridge, at the helm. Legends will serve 900 students next year when they have a full K through eight membership. I'd um, also just like to note that this award was given to them from the Maryland Alliance of Public Charter Schools. <clears throat> and there are over 51 charter schools in the state of Maryland serving over 24,000 students. And right here in Prince George's County, um, Legends Charter School has been recognized for excellence. Uh, so we want to congratulate them on winning Charter School of the Year. If you could please join me in giving them a round of applause. We have the CEO, founders, the founders are here, so we'd like to have them come forward to receive their uh, award. Um, I have two special awards to uh, present or presentations to make. I was going to save it for last, but I think we'll go, because I want everyone to hear these um, recognitions. And the first one is being point, uh, presented to our former board member who left us to run for elective office but she's still active in the community and she's still coming here trying to take charge. <laughs> I like for board, former board member Belinda Queen from December 2016 to March, 20, uh, March 2022. Thank you for providing your public service and leadership to the Board of Education for Prince George's County. As a member of the Board of Education, you spearheaded the development of more inclusive and equitable policies for students and staff. You, your successful advocacy for quality programs and wraparound services will enhance the education, development, development, collegiate, and career success of our students for years to come. We also acknowledge your dedicated leadership of the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee as the chair. <clears throat> we greatly appreciate your service to the people of Prince George's County and dedication to the mission and values of the Prince George's County Public Schools. Presented on this 27th day of, well, it says presented on this 24th day of March because that's when you left us, Board of Education for Prince George's County, Prince George's County Public Schools. Colleagues. <laughs>
us effectively tonight. I mean, this is his last meeting, and we wanted to present him with a token of our appreciation. And this is presented to Joshua M. Thomas, board member, District 2, December 2018 through December 2022. Thank you for your tireless efforts and unwavering support of students and staff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your tireless efforts and unwavering support of students, staff, and residents of Prince George's County. The foundation for the success of Prince George's County Public Schools is attributable to your dedication and commitment to improving education and ensuring equitable access to quality instruction for all students. On this 20 day, 27th day of October 2022, respectfully, Juanita Miller, Board Chair, and Dr. Golson, Monica Golson, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Prince George's County Schools, and the rest of this board. Mr. Thomas would like to make a comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller, um, and good evening, everyone. I just wanted to offer a few remarks on my final day sitting here on this dais, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to say that when I ran to represent District 2 on this board four years ago, I had absolutely no idea what the future would have in store. And I think all of my colleagues can probably agree that uh, we didn't either. Um, but four years later, I leave this board uh, a little wiser, uh, my hair a little longer, and uh, a much stronger sense of my purpose here on this earth. Um, I want to state my deep appreciation to Dr. Goldson and her team. Uh, though we have not always agreed on every issue, you've always been professional, responsive, and consistently committed uh, to the thing that matters to us all the most, and that's our students. Dr. Coleman, Mr. Herbstman, Mr. Dickerson, uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Coley, Dr. Fossett, Mr. Zuckerman, uh, my friends, Dr. Murphy, Mr. Burnett, um, thank you all and those who I did not name for the work that you do and for your commitment to our students. Um, thank you to my colleagues that have led with honesty and integrity. Um, I wish you the very best as you move forward in, in your time on this board, uh, as um, the future has a lot in store for, uh, for this board and, and what that might look like. Uh, and last but not least, I want to most importantly thank our teachers, our support staff, our custodians, our bus drivers, the people who keep this entire system going and who are in the trenches doing the hard work of providing education to our students. Uh, they are the most important part of the school system and uh, must recognize them. Uh, I leave this board with nothing but gratitude. Uh, and with my last words, I just want to remember my ancestors uh, who come from the state of Kerala in the very south of India. Uh, I invoke their spirit and their presence here today. Uh, and I just wanna say that they could never have imagined uh, their son holding a seat in elected office on the other side of the planet. Uh, and I am truly uh, an example of their wildest dreams. 
Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you to my colleagues and um, wishing everyone the very best moving forward. Thank you. Now we will move to a moment of silence. Colleagues, at this time, I ask that you all join me in honoring the memory of the following Prince George's County Public School staff, family, and community members with a moment of silence. Mary Ellen Johnson, mother of Donna Park, supervisor, purchasing and supply services office. Mr. James Alston, Jr., father of Dr. Helen Coley, Chief of School Support and Leadership, and Jamie Austin, Management Analyst in the Department of Supporting Services, Building Services Office. Dale Robertson, Teacher, Surrattsville High School. Catrice Adams, Secretary, Dodge Park Elementary School. Tom McDaniel, Senior, former educator and pupil personnel worker with Prince George's County Public Schools. Wallace A. Reed, building supervisor, Surrattsville High School. Kimberly Mayo, teacher, Potomac Landing Elementary School. Mary Allison, food service assistant, Greenbelt Middle School. Please continue to keep these families in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Now for the upcoming meetings of the board. Our next meeting of this board will be held on Thursday, November 10th, 2022. The Academic Achievement Committee, chaired by board member Sapora Miller, will meet virtually on Monday, November 14th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. The Policy and Governance Committee, which is chaired by Ms. Judy Mickens Murray will meet virtually on Tuesday, November 15th, 2022 at 5 p.m. And the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee, chaired by Dr. Kenneth Harris, will meet virtually on Wednesday, November 16th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Please continue to check our webpage for information about upcoming board meetings. And also the board has created a website. Um, well, we are on social media now. And thanks to one of our staff members, um, Cindy Adeline, who has set up uh, a Facebook page for the board, um, Twitter, and I think Instagram. And we're only publishing good news about Prince George's County. So we know folks go to social media, look for it there. Thank you. Now, we will have the report of the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Uh, who's, uh, Mr. Burnett, who is uh, sitting, the designee for Dr. Golson this, this evening. Dr. Uh, Mr. Burnett. Thank you, Chair Miller, and good evening to the board members, the attendees here, and to those viewing um, our board meeting this evening. It's my honor to uh, represent Dr. Golson as she represents us nationally at Harvard University this evening. This Friday, we will host the fourth annual PGCPS Hall of Fame Gala at MGM National Harbor, hosted by the Excellence in Education Foundation for PGCPS. The gala recognizes alumni who are trailblazers in their field. Proceeds fund scholarships for our high school seniors to help them pursue their college dreams. This year's event has so far raised $225,000 and features a fashion show and an online silent auction of our student artwork. Thanks in advance to the foundation and congratulations to this year's Hall of Famers. Parents and guardians, if your child still needs required immunizations for school, please join us at the Fall Immunization Festival this Saturday, October 29th, from 9.30 a.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. at Northwestern High School in Hydesville. 
There will be food and fund activities for the entire family. Visit the PGCPS website to reserve a time slot for the free immunizations. It's not too early to start thinking about next school year. Join us at the specialty program showcase on Thursday, November 3rd at Charles Herbert Flowers High School in Upper Marlboro from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. Also, congratulations to Dodge Park, Langley Park McCormick, Mount Rainier, Robert Gray, and Spring Hill Lake Elementary Schools for earning a spot on Healthier Generations 2022 list of America's healthiest schools. Spring Hill Lake was one of just 11 schools nationwide to receive an all-star award for outstanding distinction in all of the criteria. Congratulations to those schools. Thank you, Dr. Miller, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. Prince George is proud. We're just doing things all over this country, not just in Prince George's County. And I'd just like for us to give Prince George's County Public Schools another round of applause. Thank you. Now we will move into the introduction of committee members and committee uh, charge. First, we will begin with the Policy and Governance Committee. Mrs. Nickens Murray, I yield the floor to you to introduce the committee charge and its members. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Policy and Governance Committee is charged with facilitating short and long range strategic planning for the school system, providing oversight of board policy, legislative, and government matters involving federal, state, county, and municipal government agencies and officials. The committee shall ensure that board governing policies are current and compliant with federal, state, and county laws and consistent with best practices in public education. The policy and governance committee members and CEO representatives are as follows. My Judy Mickens Murray, Chair. Mr. Alvaro Saron Ruiz, Vice Chair, and he's our student board member. <coughs> Ms. Pamela Booza Struther, board member, Mrs. Sonia Williams, board member and vice chair, Dr. Juanita Miller, board chair ex officio, and Ms. Robin Welsh, director PGCPS Office of Government Relations and Compliance and Procedures. This school year beginning August 2022 and ending June 2023, the committee plans to review and discuss 30 policies in order to further advance the Prince George's County Public Schools goal of providing an excellent education to our students and empowering our communities. These policies are selected as committee focus on the recommendations received from the Chief Executive <laughs> Officer for the board policies that require review due to legal ramifications, citation corrections, rescissions, cycle updates, and to be in alignment with existing administrative policies and or enacted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mickens, Board Member Mickens-Murray. Now we will move to Policy and Governance Committee recommendations. And I yield the floor to you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Policy and Governance Committee met virtually on October 18, 2022, with the following members in attendance. Judy Mickens-Murray, Alvaro Suez Ciron Ruiz, Committee Vice Chair, Sonia Williams, Pamela Booza Struther, and Dr. Juanita Millo, Miller, ex officio. The committee discussed the revisions to the following policies. Policy 4114, School Official Financial Disclosure, as the CEO recommends for rescission. Policy 412, 4112, Appointment of Personnel, a new policy, pedestrian safety plans, and policy 0120, system oversight. The policy 412, 4114, school official financial disclosure was developed to ensure that each school official files a disclosure statement by January 31 of each year, and at any other time a potential conflict or of interest arises. The current language of 4114 
is now obsolete. It no longer aligns with relevant laws, policies, and regulations. The purpose of policy 4112, appointment of personnel, is to provide guidance to the appointment of PG PGCPS personnel. The purpose of the new policy, pedestrian safety plans, <clears throat> is to provide guidelines for the development of pedestrian safety plans. The purpose of policy 0120, systems oversight, is to clarify the roles of the board and CEO in system oversight. The committee voted unanimously to forward all four policies to the full board with a recommendation that the policies be sent out for public comment. Madam Chair, I make a motion at this time that the four policies be um, voted on to go for public comment. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the board policies the recommendations from the uh, Policy and Governance Committee be approved for, to, for public comment. Vote, uh, public comment. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mickens Murray. Now we will move to the public comment on the agenda and non agenda items. Colleagues, we have six registered live public comment speakers this evening and one written public comment. The written public comments have been posted on board docs for public access. Note to public, you have registered to speak in a public forum where the Board of Education will listen to your comments. The board will not address your comments. You must speak on the topic for which you have been registered. All registered speakers will have three minutes to provide comments. At the sound of the buzzer, you may complete that sentence only. Registered speakers may not relinquish any part of their speaking time to another registered or unregistered individual. Speakers may not address individuals or issues with profanity or derogatory terms. You will be warned once. If you continue to, you may be asked to leave the building. Speakers are encouraged to use titles rather than names. For example, principal, CEO, deputy superintendent, etc. Your adherence to these guidelines will enable the public participation process to move smoothly. Our first registered speaker for tonight is Mr. Martin Diggs, ACE AS asked me local 2250 for 2225, uh, and he will speak on the negotiated agreement. Mr. Diggs. Thank you so much, and good evening. <clears throat> good evening. Good evening to Dr. Gosen and her absent, and also to Chair Miller and to the board members. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you all tonight. I ask for a bit of grace for the three minute time limit. I promise I won't abuse it. I'm President Martin Diggs of Ace Asked Me Local 2250 for almost three years now. Along I come with the, um, although I come from transportation's chapter and driving a school bus for 20 years, that is something that will be engraved in me forever. Um, I come representing approximately 5,000 employees, professional, well-trained and hardworking employees of Prince George's County Public School System, over 200 job titles and classifications of nine chapters. I come with serious concerns, and I and many others believe if we can fix these problematic issues, the customer service given to our youth and parents across Prince George's County will drastically improve. On July the 1st, 2022, Local 2250 and PGCPS signed a new positive historical contract. But there are certain individuals from the side of management deliberately ignoring our negotiated agreement. They have said in so many words, to correct pay issues is not my only responsibility. Supervisors verbally direct those who process payroll to pay less than what's been agreed upon in our, in our contract. Now imagine, <clears throat> now imagine working your full schedule hours and you're told later that you're not gonna be paid for the hours that you worked. All we wanna do is get paid for what we do. When I have spoken with the CEO, I believe that she's being upfront with me that she wants to fix problematic issues. However, there's a breakdown between us and those who are hired to do their jobs. Either it is deliberate 
or becomes someone just does not really care because it's not affecting their paycheck, so why should they worry about it? On three separate occasions, management has given employees a date that payroll problems would be fixed, and to this day, many still are not corrected. Problems like a 5% COLA being added to their pay, they don't get it. Employees not receiving the correct grade increase, and in some cases, going in reverse. Employees not receiving correct hours agreed upon, so they end up needing retro pay. They are told that their retro payment would, re would come in two to three pay periods. That's six weeks, everyone. And, and who's being held accountable for this when it's not completed? So many workers are overworked, underpaid, stressed out. This, to the CEO and the board, we just want to be valued. We want to be treated with respect, and we want to hear thank you more often. And we want to pay our bills on time. While the blueprint for Maryland's future provides funding to aid in the ESP positions, there's still more to do. With the recruitment and retention being so difficult, the welfare and safety of students and the fellow staff are at risk. Employee paychecks are lower, and in some cases, some workers aren't even getting a paycheck. Can you imagine working a full 40 hours work week and being told that you still have to wait two or three pay periods? And in closing. Mr. Diggs, your time is up, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Next is Tanya Vita Wingfield, Individual uh, Board Policy. Good evening. I want to offer to uh, speak on two comments, a little constructive criticism and some praise. Um, the board last month reported, uh, uh, actually um, voted on the Inspector General uh, MSDE report and that report actually was set to look at the scope of the uh, ethic panels investigation and if it uh, had it wasted um, education funds well I just want to remind the board that those complaints were based on citizen sworn complaints uh, so there's no way that, that it was a waste of funds also remember the report said that there was not evidence um, that was not used, but at the beginning of each report, it said the, investigated, the investigation included propounding inter interrogatories, requests for production of documents, as well as interviews. So all this information was considered. You know, the board members just had an opportunity to come to a hearing, and they chose not to. So uh, also, I have my sworn statements I'm going to leave with you. But this is not about pointing fingers. This is about looking at the systemic issues with this board that continues to have bad behavior happen because it's baked into the system. And so it's not always about the people. It's about these policies that operate this board. And so with that, I want to commend the policy committee for the changes that are proposed in policy 0107 that are seeking to hold board members and everybody in the system more accountable and put up guardrails to curb some of this bad behavior so, that, so it doesn't continue to happen. Also, uh, with the boundary proposal, I would also like to commend the administration on that proposal. I know that this is a fluid proposal. There's going to be decisions that will change based on the input from the community. Uh, what I would ask the board to uh, think about in the administration, because this is something that I have been hoping for for years, and that is that we can finally move to a K, K, to, uh, K through 5 model, because that is something that we are 20 years behind on. Also, uh, moving back to neighborhood schools so that our younger kids can have that bond within their communities. Uh, Glen Arden Woods, about 15 years ago, proved to us that we can have rigor in any community school regardless of the demographics. So we need to go and look back at that model that Glen Arden Woods gave us. It's there for us. We were successful with it. We were a blue ribbon school with it. And we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wingfield. Next speaker will be Ms. Belinda Queen individual boundary policy and budget I'm back <laughs> hello everybody greetings to Dr. Gosen and her absence to staff to Madam Chair Vice Chair my fellow former board members and the new ones 
we must remember that all of us are taxpayers and every taxpayer spent big dollars in our county toward public education. And we want to continue to be Prince George's County Public School proud. Some of us have kids, some grandkids, and others do not have kids in school, but we are concerned about future generation of scholars. We are in the middle of major developments of downtown Prince George's and developments all around metro lines throughout Prince George's County. In the Wilburn community where I live at and along on both sides of my home near Walker Mill Mini School, many homes and apartments are in the planning stage. Where would these scholars go? We're talking about closing Concord Elementary School. Now I get it, we're short teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, maintenance workers, and other staff. We have outdated buildings, backlog of maintenance, but is combining these schools really the best solution? Yes, I get it as a former board member, we have to make tough decisions. I've had a hard time still understanding why you don't think outside of the box constantly. I have said this many a time, even with the middle schools that's being opened in 2023, still box looking schools. No creativity, no art, making them stand out to be different. As I drive down Marlboro Pike and I look at the beautiful Bishop McInerney with the beautiful round architect scene from the road before the rest of the box building, I'm thinking a great outside the box look that you see, even though it's still a box school, but a great look. Why don't we have staff or even find research developers with creative thinking? I would like to quote a scripture from Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. George Carver said, where there is no vision, there is no hope. I'll add, without courage, dreams die. Life vision is a big picture and has many components that make us what we want our daily life to look like. This speaks to the need of real leadership, not followers or destroyer that lose the sight and focus on our communities and our future generation down the road. I ask that each of you in your decision making of our scholars, factor communities. Think about our scholars, families, households, safety, physical and social surrounding. Stop selling our scholars and future generations short, killing their dreams, but dream big and have a vision. Think more for all students, teachers, parents, staff, and for our community. Thank you all in advance for Dr. Ghost, and I know we have great staff. I know you have great support. We here at Prince George's County have the best, but let's vision more and keep moving our school system forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Queen. Next, Phyllis Wright, Individual Boundary and General. Good evening, everyone. Phyllis Wright, PTO President of William Hall Academy. I'm here tonight to stand and speak for the parents and the children that goes to my school. Safety, we do not have a security officer in the school and there have been multitudes of fights there. We have kids that walk into school where there's no sidewalks. Marlboro Pipe and Capitol Heights Boulevard is a dangerous area. I wish you all would please think of putting a crossing guard at the top of Capitol Heights Boulevard and Marlboro Pipe for the kids' safety. I was told that a couple of children has been hit by cars on Marlboro Pipe. It's not safe for our children. We should have security there at William Hall Academy because we've had a record numbers of fights there. My children are there. I'm thinking about the safety not just of my kids but all of the kids at the school there. So if we can please have some security, work on some sidewalks for the safety of the children who's walking in the middle of the street trying to get to school and also have a crossing guard there. You know, that's why I'm here today to speak up for the parents and the children of William Hall Academy. And we need to have something done with that. We have bus students, but we also have a lot of students that walk walk to school and I'm worried about their safety. As a parent, I would be worried about my children if they wasn't able to cross the school and they would have to run thinking that a car was gonna run them down if they're not out, out in front of the street in time. So if we can look at getting some crossing guards there, Capitol Heights Boulevard and Marlboro Pipe at the top, not just at the bottom, and we can do something with the sidewalks because kids are walking again in the middle of the streets and in the morning it's very dangerous. So that's all I had to say, and thanks for taking time out to listen. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Right. Next, we will have Delvin Champagne, Strategic Co Collegiate 501c3 General Comments. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Delvin Champagne. I am a Prince George's County, I'm a father. I'm a Prince George's County parent times three. Um, all three of my kids attend the Dark Kennedy French Immersion Specialty School in Greenbelt. My wife and I are both um, licensed occupational therapy special educators. Uh, my wife was a former um, Prince George's County itinerant occupational therapist. Um, I did my research um, when I was in graduate school at Howard University on the Diamante Driver um, oral health matter that happened about 10 or 15 years ago. And while I was at Howard Graduate School, I was able to get a fellowship to further that study in Boston at the Harvard Medical School, School, School of Dental Medicine, that was studying that Diamante Driver, Prince George's County Public School uh, matter at that time. And I was a part of a program called the Biomedical Sciences Careers Program that's an, that is an annual diversity program that sends um, top students, um, high school students, to, to Boston to, to further their, their, um, their interest in, in biomedical health sciences. And so in, in pre-pandemic, well, pre-pandemic, I was, my program um, had the talented 10 students registered to go to the conference in Boston um, from Blazenburg and Flowers, but during the pandemic um, stopped our trip. And so now they've been virtual for the last three years and they're back um, in person in 2023. And I'm trying, um, and I, because I was part of that program, my program has secured 10 seats for Prince George's County Public Schools, high school students to go to Boston to the Biomedical STEM Conference. And so it's a free conference if you can get there. Um, and so I'm here just asking anybody on, the, in the, on this platform, anybody listening, if they could assist us to attend the talented 10 Prince George's County Public Schools to Boston in April, we need $5,000. And so um, um, our fiscal sponsor, the, the, um, the Black Student Fund, um, is having their school fair in, on, on Sunday. And we have schools looking to send their top African-American students from top private schools. They want to send me a check, but I'm refusing to take their money if we can get some support from the county because I want to hold out for Prince George's County Public Schools. And, um, you know, like, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Miller said, we need positive things in the county. We need a win in Prince George's County. And I would love to have that NBC4 and Fox 5 news press conference, PGCPS sends the talented 10 students to Boston, to the Harvard Biomedical STEM Conference. And so thank you. I hope you guys can, can help me send the kids to Boston. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Yes. Jocelyn Ford, individual open discussion. <clears throat> Good afternoon, school board members. I wanted to inform you about our previous two leadership meetings on the topic of wheelchairs, ortho students now being placed on special ed and non-public routes. During these two meetings, we have stated that ortho would be assigned to special ed and non-public routes in extreme emergency. Today, there are still several bus lots that have several ortho students assigned to special ed and non-pub. John Hansen, for example, has five special ed non-public routes now. Ortho students, when asked when asked by the supervisor why I was informed that the per of routers, why these kids are on our special on special ed and non-public. Due to the new contract that special ed and non-public drivers are being paid to do ortho. We have spoken to the supervisor of Douglas Bus Lot and explained that he was under the same expression. We have been discussing the situation since August and nothing has been accomplished with getting ortho students assigned to ortho routes was the first priority. Local 2250 did not bargain 
for our special non-public attendance to receive a grade two five pay for them to transport ortho students. We have contractual language in about ortho drivers and attendants. They have their own classification, seniority policy, and bid on all orthopedic work. Not only this is placing ortho students on special ed and non-public routes violates the CBA, its majority safety concern. We have addressed in the past leadership meeting as well. I urge you to please make the necessary change to remove the ortho students from special ed non-public runs immediately as promised October the 11th and August the 25th and place them accordingly on orthopedic runs. Your le leadership team from uh, Local 2250. I need to talk to you for a second about these parents and kids and their behavior on these school bus. We as bus drivers do not have the protection on our bus and these parents are coming and approaching us and all kinds of things are happening. They pull the tape, we get pulled off the buses and we have to wait for CPS and all the charges that have to go through. When we are found innocent, there is nothing done to the kids, the parents, no public apology, no letter written saying I'm sorry for what's done because it's, it's just making our job harder, okay? And I would like to bring it to your attention that we are tired. We cannot keep this pace up driving like we're doing this year and last year and going on. We need to come together and figure out a solution and listen and talk to us because we have, when we come to the table, we have solutions, but management is not trying to listen. And these are incorrect run <coughs> sheets that we be dealing with every day. It says unnamed roads. Thank, Thank you, Ms. You. Ford. Mm -hmm. This concludes our public comment. The testimony of the commenters, com commenters who registered and provided written or electronic testimony has been posted on board docs for review by board members and the public. And one written comment was from Irma Aribe on individual and individual opposed to closure of Pointer Ridge Elementary. Now we will move to our consent agenda. Mr. Burnett, would you please introduce items 4.1 through 4.5? Yes, thank you, Chair Miller. Items 4.1 through 4.5 requires board approval of proclamations commemorating Maryland Emancipation Day, American Education Week, National Apprenticeship Week, Na National Native American Heritage Month, and National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week in Prince George's County Public Schools. May I have a motion to approve items 4.1 <coughs> through 4.5 under consent agenda? Second. It has been moved and second to approve items 4.1 through 4.5 under consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, <clears throat> all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion passed. Now we will move to the budget consent agenda. Um, Mr. Burnett, November 22nd expenditure requirements. Please yes, item 5.1 requires board approval of the November 2022 expenditure requirements. It has been moved in second <clears throat> to approve the um, to appro approve the 20, uh, November 22 expenditure requirements. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Signify by saying aye. Opposed? I apologize, uh, Board Member Adam Stafford. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm trying to see if maybe you can help me to be this uh, more clearly. I am not seeing on page four. I, I see the actuals for uh, July and August, um, and I'm just wondering if you could possibly let me know if when we will see the actuals for September and October, or if that's 
somewhere else. And I was wondering if you could put, if, if the budget could be broken down where you see the monthly budget versus the monthly actuals. Because right now we see the annual budget for each category and the monthly actuals, but we don't see the monthly budget and the actuals. I don't know if that's possible. Well, we have Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Herbstman here, but we'll, we'll take the recommendations that you made at, at the end so that we can note it, but he could possibly answer your, your first question. Thank you. Yes, uh, to the first question, um, this report was produced uh, before the September month had closed, so we only had uh, data available for July and August. Um, the September month ends up closing in mid-October, so at that point we didn't have it. So on the next month's uh, meeting, you'll see it with uh, September as well. Is that it? Um, yes, that's it. I'll uh, redirect for some follow-up questions afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Williams. Just a point of clarification. Um, when the CFO closes the books, they have to, it's like balancing the checkbook, so it takes a little bit of time to get, um, to get it all done. So we're usually doing two months behind for actuals to be presented to us in our, expend our monthly expenditures. We'll do the proposed um, expenditures for the coming month and then you will receive the actuals that are two months behind. That's the way it typically works. Thank you. Um, and what I'm asking is that we see the monthly budgets in addition to the actuals as well. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And the student is not voting in this. Any uh, opposition? Hearing none, the motion passes uh, on the budget consent agenda. Next, item 6.0, uh, governance second reader, unfinished business. Fiscal year 2023 comprehensive <coughs> maintenance plan. Mr. Burnett, please introduce item 6.1. Yes, item 6.1, it's second reader uh, for board approval of the fiscal year 2023 comprehensive maintenance plan that uh, you've received. Uh, may I have a motion to approve item 6.1 under the consent agenda? It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? Board member Adam Stafford. Um, yes, thank you. I have uh, several questions here, um, and so I'll, I'll begin uh, with going through the maintenance plan. You know, the, the last presentation that we read uh, talked about three-year goals of increasing the percentage of work orders completed, and I wanted to know, was that goal achieved in 2021? Um, we have a total, the plan also states that there's a total of 36 vacancies and since we have received the report, have those vacancies been filled? I'm specifically interested in HVAC um, because in my community uh, there are many concerns around that. I'd also like to know about custodial load restructuring, you know, as we have schools that are over capacity. Um, you know, and we know that custodians are assigned by the square footage and not necessarily the density of the school. Um, you know, I'm just asking, you know, has that been taken into consideration considering the increased workload on custodial staff? And then in the last year, um, the IAC report, when they came to the OBAFA committee, we received a 66% a not adequate with 34 schools receiving that score of not adequate and 306 minor um, def, um, deficiencies. And so I honestly would like to know, you know, this report that we've been looking at hasn't given us um, any follow-up to those items or how those things have been resolved. And so I wanted to know if you could speak to that. Thank you. 
And we have Mr. Sam Stefanelli, who's director of plan Service. operations and maintenance. Uh, I'm going to try to take those one at a time. Um, the percentages I believe you were speaking of was our per percentage of preventative maintenance of our total workload. Um, our goal was to double our uh, pre preventative maintenance every year. Uh, Dr. Golson and I started this 2014 when I believe when she was COO. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID and the, and the work related around COVID in 2019, 20, and continuing, we fell short of our goal this year. We made our goals uh, for all the years up to this year, but this year we did not meet our goal. However, we are focused to continue that work to uh, increase our preventative maintenance. It's all about having the, the proper resources uh, to perform preventative maintenance. We have another matrix that we look at um, how long it takes us to perform a preventative maintenance work order, and we want those to be done within 30 days. If you cannot perform a PM work order within 30 days, what you're basically doing is creating work orders that we do not have the resources to uh, accomplish. And we are now at that point where we're right at 80% of the work orders that we create, we're able to uh, achieve. So we have to establish more resources. And Dr. Golson has increased the resources to our apartment, our department for this year. And we're looking to increase them again in uh, FY24 to continue this process. The, the school system hasn't had preventative maintenance for 30 years. We have a, it's a slow process to get us back on track, but we're continuing that work. And hopefully uh, with the resources that we're afforded now, we'll be able to get back on track and keep that process moving. Um, the custodial staff, I, I agree with, with your assessment. We, we staff our buildings by size, not by population. However, we have uh, Barack Obama, I believe, has 700 students. Mother Jones has 1,400 students. It's the same building. So what we've done is Dr. Golson afforded us, I believe it was 10 FTEs that we're able to split into 20 part-time people so we can give some extra resources to the schools that are overcrowded. But there's still some work to be done there. Did I miss? report what has been done based on the recommendations from that report for us to become in the adequate category yeah the IAC uh, the IAC report uh, they changed their fun the function of that report a few years ago and that was what our meeting was about they know they're not looking at the conditions of our facilities so much as our ability to maintain the facilities and that's all around preventative maintenance our preventative maintenance program is not where they want it that's why we are in the 60s that's why dr. Golson has afforded us more resources and we are building to get to the capacity that the state wants us to be and we are working with the state to make sure we're heading in the same direction but we are not where we need to be as far as the resources for preventative maintenance to beat their goals thank you um, mr stefanelli uh board member adam Stafford. Uh, Yes, I, I would just ask, is there a preventative maintenance plan to get us on track? We have two plans that are moving simultaneously. Our, our original plan was to, uh, as opposed to having a plan for every school, we, we, we attack large equipment, chillers, boilers, our big equipment. We have a plan and we have a process to PM all of our large equipment across the system because we have such a large system. So we've accomplished that. We've just contracted with a company we are working with right now that's going school by school. They're going to barcode all of our uh, mechanical equipment and they're going to develop a uh, plan for every piece of equipment that we have throughout the system. I have to, um, you have to be cautious because that's going to give us the plan. And what that's going to show us is the resources that it's going to take us to perform that plan. And we do not have the resources to perform the plan at this time, but we are working towards that goal um, my ask is that we see that preventative maintenance plan along with this maintenance plan so that we can understand you know what are the resources you need to to complete that plan so that we can be in the adequate category and that's that's information that Absolutely. I haven't seen until and we can make that available this plan is a plan that's required by the state and they mm -hmm. have strict guidelines on what needs to be in here 
And this is following their guidelines, and we're approving this so Dr. Golson can provide it to the state. But we can provide all the information you, you would like around our preventative maintenance plan as we develop it. This is this process is taking place. It's going to start taking place at the beginning of the, uh, in January, and, and as we move forward, we can show you what, what we're accomplishing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stefanelli. Um, uh, Vice Chair Williams. Thank you, Mr. Stefanelli, for all that information. Um, in trying to connect all the dots. Uh, we have a three-cycle building redo plan. Those, um, the schools that are put in those cycles that are currently in cycle one, that is because it's the highly need school for maintenance or repair or even redo. Even though it's in the cycle one, if we are not replacing that school or reconstructing that school or rebuilding that school, those are the items that are showing up on your preventive maintenance plan, which impacts our score to the state, correct? Yes, it does. And, and what happens is the, the, the schools in cycle one, I will still do my best to maintain it because students are still there. However, it does limit the capital dollars that we can put forward to that facility. And I use a lot of capital dollars to help maintain the school. So there is, there is a drop off there. Um, mm -hmm. but our capital programs department has an aggressive plan to fix that and fix that quickly but allowing those schools to proceed yes. in cycle one to be to get them off of your capital maintenance yes. plan would allow your staff to Cap go to yes, the other would. schools and yes. so i think that that is very important for everyone to understand those that are sitting at the dais and those that are listening that getting us out of that cycle adding schools or putting in schools that are not in this current cycle will then impact your ability to maintain them. I think that that is very important for people to understand that this was a thoughtful process and that uh, we have to stick to the plan in order to reduce our maintenance to improve our grade to the state. And so we, you talked about um, the ability to complete a maintenance uh, item in 30 days. And you also mentioned that uh, if we don't meet that, it's because of your staff and the sizing of your staff that you have available. The P3 that we are using that has financing, design, construction, and maintenance, that will help your, your staff? Yes, indeed. Um, the, the P3 program is going to completely take that facility off of our plate because the contractor is responsible for maintaining the equipment there. So not only will I no longer have the older school to, to deal with, I won't need to perform the preventative maintenance on the new schools for, I believe it's 25 30 years. years. Mm -hmm. and 30 years. 30 years. So that's going to, we, we had a long discussion this afternoon about that process mm -hmm. between my staff and capital programs. and. That's going to do a lot to help us move towards having the resources to take care of the other facilities. Right. So as we're pulling on, bringing on these new facilities that were highly need schools when it comes to facilities under the P3, we're bringing on six new schools. We're taking out four or something to that effect. Those four you don't have to worry about anymore because exactly. they're replaced. Yes. And so, and then you don't have to bring on the new schools because the P3 partner is handling those the maintenance of that freeing up your staff to focus on. And so all of this is tied together. So when we sort of maneuver and put new schools in, it, it disrupts our ability to, to meet our plan and support you to help us improve our grade at the state. So I just wanna say thank you to your staff because I know it's a challenge. We're about to go into the winter months where we have a lot of Band-Aids on our heating equipment our roofing equipment, our doors. And so just I just wanted to say thank you to your staff for all that they do and what they're about to have to deal with over the winter. So thank you, Mr. Stefanelli. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member, uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, hey, thanks for acknowledging me. Good evening, Dr. I mean, Mr. Stefanelli, how you doing? Good evening. Good. Um, quick question for you. You mentioned uh, barcoding equipment. Um, do you know what the tentative completion date is or high level projected milestones for something like that, you know, moving from a more document centric to a electronic kind of model based approach to maintaining your equipment, I imagine is a hard, is a pretty sizable lift. We are, we are going to attempt to have this completed by July. Okay. However, because of the procurement process, we're a little behind, so it may not happen that quickly. 
what we're doing is we're implementing a new work order system. The mm -hmm. work order system we currently have has been upgraded. So as part of this new upgrade, we're going to collect all this information and have it uh, have the uh, the one process take place all at the same time. So at the end of the day, our goal is to have a barcode on all our equipment so we can track that equipment from birth to death, what the maintenance cost of it over the life, so we can not only help maintain the equipment, we can get a better idea of what equipment we want to use in the future because we, we can see the, the cost of ownership as well as the, uh, as, we, as, well as the purchase cost of the equipment. Okay. So hopefully and by July 1, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm afraid we won't make that because we haven't started because our the procurement process for this complicated uh, issue takes a little while. Yeah, I imagine. And I assume there's probably some um, assistance from manufacturers as well when it comes to uh, warranties and keeping track of stuff like that. Yeah, what, what happens is, is that the company comes in and we have a specific piece of equipment. The manufacturer gives us the information to for preventative maintenance and that is downloaded into the system so th this is information directly from the manufacturer yes got it thank you any further discussion hearing none all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. Oh, all those in favor of the comprehensive 2023 comprehensive maintenance plan say aye. aye opposed hearing no opposition the motion passed now we will move to revised policy 1500 parent and community advisory council and uh at Ms. adam stafford do you wish to report on that i, I received notice earlier today that you weren't I was going to address that in item 7.2. That was the specific item. Yeah. But uh, we, I can, okay, I can well, speak on it now. Yes. Um, we're, we're going to ask to move this to a future meeting uh, because the PCAC would like to further uh, confer with the Policy and Governance Committee on their bylaws. So you're uh, moving. Can you speak? Can yes. You you want a table, peace cap. We, we want to make sure that we're talking about the right policy. You're talking about the bylaws, but what she's asking is the policy 1500. <coughs> yeah, and we need that to go forward. Yes, yes, okay. that's why I was saying, yeah, I think I wanted to wait till 7.2. <laughs> okay. So what's your pleasure, Madam? Well, what I, my understanding is that, um, um, Adam Stafford, is that you're supposed to introduce the PCAP? Oh, P he wants you to introduce your committee, the PCAP. <coughs> Are you prepared to introduce them tonight? We can table this. Madam Chair, could she introduce them and item 7.2 before she moves to move it to a separate date okay to give you time to prepare miss mickens murray you seem to be up on this and it says please introduce item 6.2 and 6.3 which Thank is the revised policy 1500 for parent and community advisory council and then 6.3 the new draft policy sustainability are you prepared? Yes, ma'am. Move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the uh, September 22nd, 2022 meeting, the full board voted to approve these two policies as first readers. Tonight, we would want to, uh, I make a motion to move those policies to second reader. Policy 1500, Parent and Community <laughs> Advisory Council, and Policy Sustainability, which won't have a number until we approve it. Thank you. <clears throat> it has been moved in second to approve items 6.2 through 6.3 under the consent agenda. <clears throat> Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the motion passes to um, 
approve item 6.2 through 6.3 under the consent ag agenda. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Those two policies are under the unfinished business. It's not consent agenda. It's um, six governance, second reader, unfinished business. I, I just want us to have that information for the minutes. I have it under. Okay, good, thank you. So where should, it, where are you saying that it should go? Right. But it wasn't consent. We had to take an action. I mean, we have to take an action on the consent agenda. But this is under, I mean, that's how my. Okay, we, it's been voted on. Thank you. It's been approved, so let's move forward. Okay, next, 7.0, new business first readers, the comprehensive school boundary proposal. Mr. Burnett, please introduce item 7.1 under new business uh, first reader. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, board chair. Uh, item 7.1 is uh, provided as a first reader, the comprehensive school boundary proposal. May I have a motion to approve item 7.1, Comprehensive School Boundary Proposal? I move that we accept item 7.1, Comprehensive School Boundary Proposal, as a first reader. Can I? Okay. It has been moved and second to approve the Comprehensive School Boundary Proposal as a, under the first reader uh, under new business. Is there any discussion? Vice Chair Williams. You didn't mean to, okay. <clears throat> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion pa passes. All right, next, the now we get to 7.2. Mrs. Adam Stafford, as board liaison of the Parent and Community Advisory Council, please introduce item 7.2 under new business, first reader. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, we're asking if we can move this to a future date um, because the committee would like to confer with the Policy and Governance Committee regarding their bylaws. So, so uh, we'll table this to uh, when, November? Um, yes, thank you. So we only have one meeting in November, so that's gonna be a full agenda. Table, I'll put table to November 10th meeting. Um, what, what, Vice Chair Williams? I don't think so. Do we need to vote on tabling that item or is it just acceptable for us to do that? You, you do have to take a vote to table it, if in particular to table it to a certain date and you have to take a vote then we can't table this until we take a vote. May I have a motion from yes. Adam um, Stafford to table this? Yes, I'd like to move to table uh, disc, um, item 7.2, uh, the Parent and Commun Community Advisory Council bylaws to our next uh, full board meeting on November 10th um, to give time for the group to confer and connect with the uh, Policy and Governance Committee. Second. It has been moved and second to table the uh, Parent and Community Advisory Council uh, um, item under new business for first reader until the November 10th meeting. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Next, uh, the item for, let me repeat it, for the Parent and Community Advisory Council has been tabled to November 10th. Okay, 7.3, revised policy 5113, student attendance, absence, and truancy. Mrs. Dickens Murray, which you, as chair of the Policy and Governance Committee, please introduce these items under new business for first reader. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want me to do um, item 7.3 and 7.4 since there are two policies that I'm, we're asking to move forward as yes. first readers? Okay, thank you. Uh, the Policy and Governance Committee met virtually on October 18th, 2022 with the following members in attendance. Judy Mickens-Murray, Committee Chair, Alvaro Saran Ruiz, Committee Vice Chair, Sonia Williams, Pamela Booza Struther, and Dr. Juanita Miller, ex officio. The committee discussed the revisions to the following policies. Policy 109, financial impropriety and proper conduct and whistleblowing protection. The purpose of policy 0109, financial and uh, comes as Prince George's County is a tax supported entity and recognizes its responsibility for ensuring a high level of integrity and commitment to responsible stewardship of resources. This policy outlines the school system's standard of ethics and professional conduct. The next policy, 5113, student attendance, absence, and truancy. The purpose of this policy is to promote regular school attendance by students in Prince George's County Public Schools. The committee voted unanimously to forward both policies to the full board with a recommendation that the revised policies be approved by the board at the October 27, 2022 board meeting as a first reader. So Madam Chair, at this time, I make a motion that we approve these two policies as a first reader. Thank you, um, Ms. Mickens Murray. May I have a second? It has been moved and second to uh, approve the revised policy 513, student attendance, absence, and truancy, and uh, revised policy 0109, financial impropriety, improper conduct, and whistleblower protection uh, for first reader. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dr. Harris, as chair of the Obafa Committee, please introduce item 7.5 under new business. First reader. I was ready. Here we go. <laughs> Um, so the Abafa Committee met virtually on Wednesday, October 19, 2022, with the following members. Uh, myself as chair, Ms. Madeline Sayer Frazier as vice chair, uh, and Dr. Juanita Miller. The Operations, Budget, and F Fiscal Affairs Committee voted unanimously to forward to the full Board of Education for approval the date changes presented by the Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Michael Herbstman, to the budget amendment process as first reader. In addition, during the June 8, 2022 meeting, the committee voted unanimously to forward the budget amendment process proposal presented by the CFO to the full Board of Education for approval as first reader. Do I turn the floor over to him or do you? There's He's got a short presentation. Who has a short presentation? Our CFO. Mr. Hertz, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, are we able to display the presentation? Right. And uh, thank you, Dr. Harris, Madam Chair, and uh, Board of Education members. Um, the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee charged administration uh, with drafting a new process for board member amendments that take place during the uh, Board of Education requested operating budget cycle. Uh, the process has now been discussed and refined by the ABAFA committee, as Dr. Harris pointed out, and was recently passed by the committee to move to the full Board of Education tonight. Uh, there are three interrelated phases in the amendment process. Phase one includes questions and answers. Phase two is the uh, Board of Education amendments to the CEO's proposal. And then phase three is finalization. Uh, of course, throughout all of that uh, and through the entire annual budget development process, there is continuous community engagement. In the uh, next detailed sections, in the interest of time, I'll just highlight a couple of uh, important dates that are new to the process. Uh, we've included two new sets of meetings uh, towards the beginning of the process. Both of these are optional for board members. Uh, first, the budget office will hold sessions with board members 
where uh, budget will outline and explain key sections of the budget book. Uh, these are highly encouraged for the uh, new board members that will be starting, but they're uh, also optional for uh, longer tenured board members that are interested in learning more or uh, a refresher. Uh, second, we will have small group sessions with uh, board members and administration at the beginning of the process, uh, just after the uh, CEO presents her budget. Uh, uh, there will provide additional details on some of the highlights in the budget and can answer any initial uh, high-level questions you may have at that time. Uh, this could also be a time if you'd like to discuss any potential amendments that you're considering uh, uh, presenting with the administration. Uh, again, these sessions uh, would be optional to board members. Uh, following the question and answer process and the first two work sessions and public hearings that will function uh, very similarly to the ones we've had in the past, uh, board members will submit their proposed amendments. Those amendments, uh, along with initial administration comments, will be discussed by the OBAFA committee during their February meeting, and the uh, committee will determine which amendments will ultimately move forward for discussion by the full Board of Education at uh, work session number three. Uh, budget work session number three will be different from our budget work sessions in prior years. It will be the opportunity for the board members to discuss um, um, uh, with each other uh, each amendment and uh, come to a decision at the end, either by consensus or informal vote, on whether or not it should be included in the Board of Education's requested budget. Uh, because administration will uh, know ahead of time what potential amendments will be discussed, the uh, subject matter experts will be at the work session uh, if any questions arise as the board members are having uh, their conversation on the amendment. Uh, one note here, uh, we have requested two changes to the calendar to better align with the process timeline. So the two dates shown in orange are still, uh, actually the second one uh, should be February 16th, not February 15th but these dates are still uh, under review and are, are not yet final at this time. Uh, following work session number three, the agreed upon amendments will be added to the CEO's proposed budget to become the Board of Education's requested budget. Uh, then the board will vote to adopt its requested budget on February 23rd. Uh, and uh, after that, it'll be transmitted to the county executive and county council on the following day. Uh, both the Board of Education and Administration highly encourage participation through the budget process uh, from students, families, employees, our partner organizations, and other members of the community. Uh, listed here are some of the engagement opportunities during the uh, board requested budget cycle. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Harris and the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee for their work on this process. And uh, now I will uh, return the floor to the chair for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hertzman. And um, that is a uh, that timeline will be very helpful this year, and that way we won't run into uh, untimely amendments being presented uh, when the, uh, we should be transmitting the budget to the county. So thank you uh, for following through on that request. Uh, Ms. Mickens Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Hirschman, I want to thank you for this process and I want to thank you for organizing us with managing our own expectations. And if we meet your dates, I am sure that if we offer any amendments, there will be plenty of time for the staff to make the adjustments. So I appreciate this organization. This helps me and I'm sure the rest of my colleagues. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, board member uh, Boozer Struther. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Miller. I just uh, really want to thank my colleagues, um, Chair Harris and Vice Chair Lasse Frazier, Mr. Herbstman for this process as a member who's been on the board for four years. Um, 
the uh, this budget cycle uh, started out with with very little parameters and guardrails and understanding around board response to the budget and then we made great improvement with our uh, board collective priorities early in Dr. Goldson's process and um, and then we were down to this process of amendments that I think brought you know some probably unnecessary conflict to the process and in our timing and I think it was absolutely because of not having clarity so I want to thank everyone who who brought this together I think it's um, excellent for this board and I do want to say you know some other things that it now invites a transparent process so any of us and our colleagues who are thinking about amendments can talk about them earlier and get alignment and see if we agree and, and want to bring things forward together um, if we feel they are missing from Dr. Goldson's budget proposal I think it brings unity weeks ahead of when we have to sit, vote on this and send it to the county executive so we can be doing the narrative in our community about what we're sending to county executive and what our needs are and then allows for legislative advocacy alignment before the Annapolis session concludes um, so that if we do see legislation moving and it aligns with Dr. Goldson's recommendations and or these amendments we have that chance to um, advocate and speak to it um, and a couple questions but, but I would say with all that said I, I caution us on the number of amendments because anything additive that means we have to some line is subtracted and we have to understand that um, but I do want to know who creates the budgets and fiscal notes so that we are so if there are ideas who who helps to create to the understanding of the actual budget and then who decides where the budgets are transferred from the the the, move, the taking away part to keep the balanced budget so I don't, I don't know if the chair uh, chair Harris if you want to address that or who thank you that's my question mr. Hertz so uh, in the uh, process there is also a template uh, for amendments and as part of that template uh, there's a section that asks whether uh, this uh, amendment if there's any cost related to it would be offset by um, any reductions in other areas if it's not going to uh, if it's not uh, projected to be offset by any other areas then there would be additional requests to county council at that time and um, as you mentioned there's a good likelihood that uh, if that's not um, uh, fully funded by County Council that it would come back during the reconciliation cycle uh, and um, we'd have to make reductions at that point uh, in terms of the fiscal note there is a section where uh, I apologize <laughs> Uh, there is a section in the template as well where we uh, um, attempt to uh, estimate the costs and if board members would like uh, any assistance from our team in doing that uh, we could certainly do that up front there's also a period uh, after the uh, amendments are submitted though it is a very short period where uh, administration will uh, make comments on the um, proposed amendment which would include uh, vetting the cost proposal thank you so much uh, vice chair Williams thank you so much um, I think uh, board member Boozer Strother read my notes I just want to congratulate you on this proposal because it, it just makes sense it gives us time to um, listen to each other's proposal and, and try to give thoughtful, uh, concise um, comments on everyone's proposal. And it also gives you the opportunity to come up with the fiscal notes and tell us what the effects are. So I just want to congratulate you on this, um, Board Member Harris, Dr. Harris, and Mr. Herbstman for coming up with this, this proposal. I think it's going to be doing the uh, school system a great service to get this done so thank you dr. Harris yes I just wanted to 
uh, let my co my colleagues know that this is this is definitely still a learning process. And thank you to Mr. Harrisman for um, helping us along every step of the way, as well as the OBAFA committee. Um, you see, we've got the public hearings built in. There's smaller groups for the four by four sessions. Um, we're hoping to really build uh, a sense of transparency and collaboration around this. Um, so, but again, there will be growing pains with this, and just like we learned from the events of last year and previous years, we hope to learn from this year as well. Um, and a last note I have here is uh, each of the board members will be receiving their individualized priorities um, probably tomorrow. I'll send them out to you tomorrow, and then, and then I'll also include some, some dates uh, for when to get information back to me, and then again, we'll continue to push the process forward. But you all should have these slides, but again, if you have any questions, you can ask me or Mr. Herbstman offline. Um, and we'll we'll get you those answers. But thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, would you like to make a motion to accept this? Do I need a motion? Isn't the first reader? Okay, I like to make it's a, a recommendation. So. Yeah, I like to make a motion to accept the recommendations from the Obafa Committee for the revised budget amendment process. It's been moved and second to accept the Obafa Committee recommendations of the revised budget amendment process. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Everybody's ready to go home, yeah. Any opposition? The recommendation is accepted or a pass for first reader. Thank you. There are no non-consent agenda items. Um, colleagues, follow-up items from the October 13, 2022 board work session have been posted on board docs. Item 10.0, motion to confirm actions taken in executive session. Motion and second to confirm actions taken in executive session on October 22nd, 27, 2022 as follows. To receive a report from the CEO, designee to discuss approved personnel appointments to receive a report from internal audit to discuss personnel and administrative matters to receive legal advice regarding pending litigation may I have a motion to confirm actions taken in executive session on October 27 no, second it's been moved and second is there any discussion hearing none all in favor Opposed, the motion passes. Hearing no opposition. Now may I have a motion to adjourn? Again, before we adjourn, we wish you well, uh, board, well, this is the last time I'll refer to you as board member. There'll be four more board member, but Joshua, we wish you much success in all uh, your future endeavors. And thank you for your services to the Prince George's County Public Schools and Board of Education. It's been moved and second to um, adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. This meeting is adjourned. Jessica.